Okay, I have a question for you. Have you ever wanted to have a dinosaur named after you? Well, this is Mike Pobin, and he has a dinosaur named after him. Opalized fossils are important to me because it has nothing to do with uh, the, the money value, and it has nothing to do with the incredible honor that I've received. That was a byproduct. You know, it's a part of history. It's a part of, not human history, it's a part of Earth planet history. This is Mike's dinosaur, Weewarasaurus pobeni, a small plant-eating dinosaur that was discovered at Weewarra, which is an opal field near Grawan, near Lightning Ridge, in northern New South Wales, Australia. These are the incredible fossils that Mike found, which are parts of the jawbone and teeth of the tiny dinosaur. I spoke to Mike and to Dr. Phil Bell of the University of New England, Armadale, about the discovery of the fossils, identification of the dinosaur, and the naming of the species. My immediate reaction when I saw this was there was nothing like it out there. In order to have a dinosaur named after you, the first thing you need to do is find one. Finding a fossil isn't easy though, you need to know what you're looking for, and to know that you need to have an interest in the anatomy and the formation of fossils. In Mike's case, this was the culmination of an unlikely series of events leading all the way from his childhood to now. Uh, I was always fascinated um with dinosaurs when I was a kid and fossilised bones and fossilised remains in general. When I was about seven or eight, my mother bought me a, a set of Encyclopedia Britannica. I poured over them when I was a kid. I didn't realise at the time how important it was. It just seemed like another part of my young life at the time. Uh, a friend of mine and I, I was uh, 16 and he was, I don't know, 19 or 20. We decided to go for an adventure. On the way back, we were stranded by floodwaters in Kuvapiti. I didn't know anything about Kuvapiti. I had a rough idea that opal came from Kuvapiti, but I didn't know anything about it and had no particular interest in it. But when you're stranded in Kuvapiti, there's not much to do except go out onto the discarded mullet keeps and have a scratch around and see what you can find. And um, I was sitting in sunshine. It was a lovely uh, spring September type day and I saw this somewhat rounded piece and picked it up and rubbed the dirt off it and licked one end where it had been broken. Now it was clearly the, the, the opalized shell, the outside shell part of a mussel shell, opalized, gem color, sparkling. You know, it was one of those choir of angels moments, you know, the Blues Brothers with the shaft of light coming through the church. I didn't realise that that moment, you know, would change my life and, and bring me here. The unlikely sequence of events was my business was hit badly when the GFC hit and I actually went back to contract teaching. But in uh, June of 2013, I was teaching and the contract was due to run out. But if that contract had been renewed, I wouldn't even have come back to the ridge. Mike's career in the opal industry has taken him from Coober in South Australia to Lightning Ridge in New South Wales. While Mike's business is gem opal, Mike's personal interests keep him hunting for fossil material. Mike found the jawbone of Weewarasaurus in a parcel of rough opal where his knowledge of fossil formations helped him to differentiate it from all of the other randomly shaped stones. It was my holy grail. Although I hoped I might one day come across a, an opalized jawbone, even if it was part of an animal that had previously been found, um, I still think it would have been an amazing occurrence. I started to go through the opal more carefully. I went straight to that bone. Most of the obvious side was covered by host rock, but especially on the right hand side, there was pr protruding a little fan shaped ridge and something in the back of my head said tooth. And if it was tooth, it was jawbone. And if it was jawbone, what was it and what was it from? And, and you know, <laughs> oh my God, oh my God. I kept the two pieces as my special little secret for a couple of years. Every now and then when I met somebody who was interested in that kind of thing, I'd, I'd dig them out and show them to, to them and they'd go, oh wow, that looks like jawbone. What is it? I don't know. I think herbivore, if it's herbivore, it's probably dinosaur. It doesn't look like crocodile, it doesn't look like fish. And then in November of 2015, I donated the pieces to the Opal Collection. Shortly after that, Phil was given the pieces. He was pretty interested, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. 
it was such an in intensely rare discovery. It was quite spine tingling. And thus begins the long arduous process of identifying the fossils which requires rigorous testing in comparison against other known fossils to ensure that the new species is just that, a new species. So it's a slow process of, of comparing the fossils that you have with fossils of other animals that are similar to it in order to test whether or not it is in fact different. It took him two incredible, crazy, hard-working years to identify and eventually prove that it was a new species. Dr Bell showed us the amazing pieces which are now in the collection of the Australian Opal Centre. So this is the lower jaw from the right side of Weewarasaurus pobeni. This is the, the front end of the jaw here, going back into the, the back end. Now we're missing parts of it, including the, this middle section and also the, the back end, which would have formed the, the jaw joint with the, the remainder of the skull. And we actually CAT scanned this jaw to look at the, the teeth that are developing inside the jaw, as well as to look at the roots, the shape of the roots of the teeth that you can already see. Because all of those things have important anatomical clues that tell us what this animal actually is. The discovery of Mike's fossil actually helped to identify an earlier, previously mysterious fossil as another example of Weewarasaurus. In addition to the jaw that's become famous as, as Weewarasaurus, there was a smaller piece uh, that was already in the collections of the Australian Opal Centre, which just had a single tooth in it, which was tantalising but not entirely informative. And it was only after comparing Weewarasaurus to, to this tiny little one and additional specimens that had come out of Lightning Ridge and elsewhere could we be you know, reasonably certain that, that it too belonged to Weewarasaurus. Lightning Ridge recently has become more famous due to several new dinosaurs, Weewarasaurus pobeni, Fostoria dimbungunmal, Lightning Claw and the briefcase dinosaur with others still under research and new discoveries being made all the time. In Mike's case and with a great deal of planet aligning, finger crossing, buy a lottery ticket kind of luck, he is now the proud owner of the specific name of a dinosaur, Weewarasaurus pobeni. The honour of having it named after me is extraordinary. The person who's doing that research has the right to name that new species. Now that name could be anything under the sun. Normally dinosaur names are in Latin form. So Tyrannosaurus rex we have a T -rex. means tyrant lizard king. In the case of Weewarasaurus, we chose Weewara, which is the location that, uh, that the fossil was found at. Saurus means lizard. And then Pobeni is the Latinization of Mike Poben's last name. So that honours his contribution, his discovery of this very fossil. It's just a tremendous honour. I think having my name attached to it is an honour disproportionate to my actual contribution. And I mean that sincerely. Because, yeah, I mean, I picked it out of the thing and I donated it, but gee, Liz and Jenny and Phil have spent years and years of their lives working on these things. I, I wish it could be called Belli and Bramali and Smithi as well, all of them. And I especially think that Phil's contribution has been massive compared to what I actually did. So what do we know about Weewarasaurus pobeni? Well, quite a bit actually, which is amazing because as you've already seen, we've only got a couple of tiny bits of jawbone and a few teeth to learn all of this from. Based on the size of this jaw, Weewarasaurus was a small animal, probably no bigger than a Kelpie or a Wallaby. These teeth were perfectly designed for shearing plants. So this was a herbivorous dinosaur based on comparisons with similar looking animals, dinosaurs that we have better skeletons of. This would have been a, an animal that got around on two legs. It probably moved in, in herds. They're moving in herds. It didn't have much in the way of defences, so herding um, and sticking with your family is a, is a pretty good uh, defence mechanism, um, safety in numbers. These animals were probably relatively common uh, around Lightning Ridge. Although there's only these two jaws that we know of this species, this broader group of animals, what we call ornithopods, uh, was quite common here among the most commonly recovered fossils that, um, 
that we find. So that this suggests that these animals were you know, quite numerous, again, moving around in herds. They do move in herds. Uh, and feeding on the, the lush vegetation that, that would have surrounded the waterways uh, of Lightning Ridge 100 million years ago. People are often amazed that you can figure out what an animal looks like based on you know, two fragments of bone or even determine that it's a new species. It's all about understanding anatomy and understanding, I guess, the larger picture of what these animals generally look like. So we have perfectly preserved skeletons of these type of animals, these ornithopods, from, uh, from China, Mongolia, the States, which gives us a much clearer idea of what these animals look like. So it's from comparing you know, these very distinctive teeth that identify this as an ornithopod dinosaur and comparing those with you know, these better known skeletons that we can get a, a picture of what this thing probably looked like. Liz researched the words Weewara, which is the region where it came from, and they're indigenous words, which means standing fire, which I imagine is a description of those little whirly whirlies in a, in a bushfire, like a little... After I saw James's illustration, I keep thinking of Weewara, I saw as standing in the fire of opal. It's, it's an amazing coincidence to me. I love the fact that it's called Weewarasaurus, lizard from Weewara, standing fire. I asked Mike what it's like to have a dinosaur named after you, especially after a lifetime of fascination with opal, fossils and dinosaurs. What was going through his mind during the two years of waiting for the formal identification process to be completed? My gut hope was that it would be a new species, in which case it would probably have my surname attached to it. If it turned out to be not a new species, but part of a pre-existing species and just added more information to the puzzle, you know, solved more problems, answered more questions, that would have been enough for me. I would have been perfectly happy with that. On a personal level, um, it's hard to explain how little events from my childhood, like getting the Encyclopedia Britannica, sitting on a dump of dirt in Kubipedi, going to Kubipedi later on and sifting through, looking for bits of rocks, moving to Kubipedi, mining, seeing much more opal, seeing more opalized specimens, then the, the move to coming over to Lightning Ridge. How all of those things have come together with the discovery of Weewarasaurus. And it's, it's just, I don't know, it's like it's mm, closed a chapter in my life or something, or just brought things together that I didn't really think were together. I look for them every day and I can't see myself ever not doing this. It's a part of history, it's a part of, not human history, it's a part of Earth planet history. It, it tells us not where we've come from, but it's a part of where the Earth has come from. And I think they're all important in that, in that respect. I mean, what people think is important and what not is going to vary from individual to individual, I get that, but I just think we need to know more and more about the past. This video was made with the support and participation of the Australian Opal Centre in Lightning Ridge. If you visit Lightning Ridge, you should absolutely visit the Australian Opal Centre. The centre hosts an annual fossil dig where you can join a team of enthusiasts and experts and help discover amazing opalised fossils. Maybe you could find a dinosaur of your own. Special thanks to Mike Poven, Dr. Phil Bell from UNE Armadale, James Cuther, Bob Smith, and all the amazing people at the Australian Opal Centre, and everyone else who helps me to do this. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing on YouTube and following along on social media. Thank you for watching. I knew then, I knew then pretty much that I was going to donate the specimens to the Australian Opal Collection here, which you should all come and see all 10 of you at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs>